Hello. This lecture is intended for the students of the fourth semester of English Honours of Rishi Bankim Chandra College. The topic is William Blake's The Tiger. The topic that I have selected for this discussion is the representation of nature, the representation of fearful symmetry, and the building of empire in William Blake's poem, The Tiger. William Blake was born on November 28, 1757 in Soho, London. Soho was then a home for artists, spiritual nonconformists, and political activists. And this influenced the creative evolution of Blake as an artist. With no formal education, Blake showed an aptitude for drawing and was sent first when he was just 10 in 1768 to Parts Drawing School in the Strand. And then at 14 in 1772, he was apprenticed to an engraver, James Bessire. Sir Joshua Reynolds' general statement about art did not please him. So he said once that, to generalize is to be an idiot. This was his typical comment and we find that in his poems this comment is very relevant. Blake eked his livelihood as an illustrator and an engraver. In 1780 Blake began engraving for booksellers and took part in the Gordon Riots. During 1780 and 1785 he exhibited seven watercolors at the Royal Academy. In 1783 his first literary work the poetical sketches was privately printed. Blake designed his linguistic style, appropriated language close to people, and used musical poetic rhythm. In 1767, he met the famous painter Henry Fuseli, who was a part of this radical group to which Blake belonged. In 1788, he published his first work and illuminated printing, three religious treatises, and annotated the works of Swedenborg. In 1789, Blake published Tyrell and using the same illuminated printing method, printed Songs of Innocence, the Book of Thel. He printed limited editions of the book and handicraft the work fully made by the author and his wife. In 1794, Blake created his famous Songs of Experience. From this collection, we have this poem, The Tiger which became inseparable from Songs of Innocence. Both books, the Songs of Innocence and the Songs of Experience, integrated each other by weaving a sort of paradox and antithesis using a language with a popular rhythm and cadence. According to William Blake, without contraries, there can be no progression. Blake, of course, was born ahead of his times and wrote under the spell of great revolutions the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789. And he also was an integral part of English radicalism. Blake abhorred the mills of Satan, the industrialization, and excesses of enlightenment reason, which he had reduced man to a mere cog in the universal machine. Loss of faith in French republicanism and the government's repressive measures against the British radicals enter into his works. However, these things are often hidden under the facade of mysticism and symbolism. Songs of Innocence and of Experience, showing the two contrary states of human soul, is the title that ought to warn us that we are not dealing simply with a collection of songs about childhood and youth, but with a treatise and an exposition. According to M. H. Abrams, Blake recognized the generative power of opposites Blake said that without contraries there can be no progression. Every part involves the whole and of course we can see the world in a grain of sand, whole infinity in the palm of our hands. Without the simultaneous presence of both states of innocence and experience, contraries would cease to exist. The states are contraries because they cannot be reconciled and this such a reconciliation within the human existence is only possible through a diabolical analysis of the content of social reality that we find often in Blake's poems. So we have to see whether Blake is the political Blake or the mystical Blake. I would be arguing in favor of the political Blake rather than 
in favor of the mystical Blake. In the Tiger, the poem, Blake combines Plutonic mysticism with myth and Christian symbolism. So these are the facts that are assumed and most of the critics have focused on these that William Blake's The Tiger combines Plutonic mysticism with Christian symbolism and myth. Blake discarded the Plutonic dualism between the soul and the body. The contrary states that are embodied in the evolving consciousness of the narrator, the voice is that of a child, the child narrator, is again present in this poem. This poem, The Tiger, is a product, product fettered and forged by dominant ideologies and morality. Therefore, the institutional apparatuses are at work in making of the tiger. The tiger is placed between the binaries of good and evil, truth and falsehood. The mind of the tiger is manacled, forged and prevented from experiencing free will and creative energy of freedom. Blake wants to reorient the consciousness into the realm of freedom and imagination. Spinoza's concept of God oblique nature as a harmonious whole is manifested in the poems of William Blake rather than Descartes' I think therefore I am or cognito ergo sum logic. Blake disregarded both Newtonian empiricism and post Descartes enlightenment philosophy. The doctrine of the dual nature of Christ, according to Blake, Jesus was both fully human and fully divine and therefore both fallible as well as of some divine action. For John Locke, the Cartesian God that allows an individual to think is kept in abeyance and the mind has no a priori concept, idea or knowledge. According to Arthur Simons, I quote Arthur Simons famous book, William Blake that was published in 1907. I quote from his work, along with the prior art, the symbolic contents of what in the songs of innocence had been hardly more than a child's strings in the earthly or divine Edens become angelic and speaks with more deliberately hid or doubled meaning. Even in The Tiger, by which Lamb was to know that here was, quote, one of the most extraordinary persons of the time, is not only a sublime song about a flame like beast, but contains some hint that the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. Now who these tigers of wrath are or who these horses of instruction are. Through this comparison between the tigers of wrath and the horses of instruction, Blake is perhaps hinting at some political rather than mystical issues of the play. Critically misimpression of Blake's poem, a wrongful arrest, a wrongful critical interpretation of Blake's tiger has been long in critical theories and criticism. The probable date of composition of Songs of Experience as 1794 has been universally accepted and there are definite evidence internal as well as external to these dating. So this comes after the French Revolution. Critical reception during Blake's lifetime was not favorable. So he was there singing his own songs in the rhythm and selling his own songs, printing his own songs. The entire song is being composed, created, produced and then sold in the market by William Blake himself. Coldridge regarded Blake as, I quote, a man of genius, a mystic, emphatically. Whether Coleridge was right in pointing out that he is a mystic, therefore he is a genius or not, we are still not sure. Lamb considered him as, I quote, one of the most extraordinary persons of the age. Why does Lamb consider him as the most extraordinary persons of the age? Is it because of his political or because of his mystical character? Is still not known. James Thompson found in Blake sincerity and wisdom and beauty. So sincerity, wisdom, beauty does go very close to mysticism as well as to the political Blake. Poets like Swinburne or B.J. Rossetti, W.B. Yeats, T.S. Eliot, they all acknowledge Blake's mastery over the poetic and the visual medium. T.S. Eliot considered Blake 
I quote, as a man with a profound interest in human emotion and a profound knowledge of them, who approached everything with a mind unclouded by current opinions. There was nothing of the superior person about him. This makes him terrifying. So the word terrifying is very important because perhaps T.S. Eliot was pointing to this divergent opinion. So against the grain, against the grain of current opinions that Blake was foregrounding in his poems. Blake waylaid the critics definitely into a trap laid by him to conceal his poetry under the garb of mysticism and metrical composition in an age that was as intolerant as ours, that blindly followed the trails of Great Britain and the making of an empire. So Blake was writing against the grain, against the concept of the empire itself, against the larger forces, the revolutionary forces that were affecting the general way of life of England. In William Blake's is the tiger, nature is cast in a new form, forced in the meals of Saturn with a fearful symmetry that predicts the making of an empire by the most exploitative, mercenary, profit-driven, first large-scale multinational company, the East India Company, and the other companies engaged in similar trade, plunder and root of nature and of human beings, of civilizations across the globe. So Blake was commenting against this Great Britain, the making of the Great Britain. The tiger therefore becomes a symbol that is reminiscent of the large forces that are produced as opposed to the production of nature. So tiger is presented in fearful symmetry as against the symmetrical beauty of natural product. Nature cast in new form. Blake has been regarded as Europe's greatest mystic poet by Sri Aurobindo. Aurobindo himself was a mystical poet and it is universal truth that his mysticism was more political than truly mystical. Blake's mysticism is deceptive and it contains an inner dialectic of protest and paradox. Blake used this facade of mysticism just to foreground disturbing images of the contemporary times. The rhythmic simplicity and the childlike awe and wonder of the tiger are also poetic devices to distract and foreground serious social issues playing, plaguing England. We must remember that his disciple Jane Taylor wrote Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and the same rhythm is used in Tiger Tiger Burning Bright. So Twinkle Twinkle Little Star was written after the composition of Tiger Tiger Burning Bright. The tiger is not the star of Jane Taylor's poem. Blake's composition art, composite art must be taken as a whole to decode the implicit message and ambivalence. Blake wrote texts, drew illustrations with pen and brushes on copper plates in acid resistant ink and with nitric acid etched away the unprotected metal to bring the composite design into printable relief. He printed the plates in colored inks on a rolling press. The combination of word and image is a prominent feature. Blake invested far more heavily in visual than the verbal. The verbal and the visual, the contrary states of innocence and experience, the dialectics, in Blake's The Tiger fused together to offer a sharp critique of imperialism, of industrialism, of degeneration of human values at the advent of the capitalist mode of production in a large scale through the development of new multinational companies like East India Company. The Royal Bengal Tiger of the Sundarbans and Blake's Tiger. The spelling the tiger, we must remember that the spelling resembles the same tiger referred to by the witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth. The sailor's story is narrated with reference to tiger, perhaps a mercenary, again a mercantile ship engaged in such large-scale colonial trade. The Times carried a short paragraph way back in 1793, an announcement of the death of a son of Sir Hector Munro, dated 3rd July 1793. I quote from that newspaper report, a son of Sir Hector Munro has been killed on passage to India. He went ashore with a party at an island where they had put into water and reclining with his companions under some tree, a tiger sprang from an adjoining thicket and seizing him in his mouth, tore the unfortunate young man to pieces. Even the design of the tiger in this uh, illustrated image of 
the poem shows a tiger standing at ease in the background there is a bare brown tree a pattern of leafless twigs and branches with stripes of autumnal colors a blue water body is in the background and with blue dark mangroves perhaps representing that same landscape of the sundarbans of west bengal in india blake must have seen the image of the tiger in bevick's general history of the quadrupeck of 1790 and in his illustration he has represented the image of the tiger in its pure full symmetry although with a image resembling a puffed animal with a smiley on his face shooting of a tiger and the making of an empire both are interrelated and the making of blake's the tiger i refer to the story of this man killed by the tigers of sundarban the word tiger was popular among the christians of europe as the bible refers to the asiatic animals and talks about the tigers of wrath the which is in shakespeare's macbeth refer to the sailor of the ship named tiger the spelling also is that of tyg a tiger during blake's time just before the composition of the poem the royal bengal tiger caught the imagination of the english people and so many newspaper articles contained the same story about the death of this english adventurer soldier of east india company for example james chronicle st james chronicle dated 2nd to 4th july 1793 the star 5th july 1793 they reproduce part of an eyewitness account in a letter written by one of munro's companion we must remember that this son munro is the son of that same munro who became lieutenant general lieutenant general he participated in the battle of baxter and during the same time in england there was the impeachment of sir warren hastings brought by edmund burke so this is at the backdrop and now we have the reproducing part of an eyewitness account later written by one of munro's companions which had been published in calcutta gazette of 1st january 1793 and uh, this has now reached london on a ship from india the event uh, must have take, um, taken place about 22nd of december so winter landscape is there 1792 the text of one of the letters from an eyewitness as follows to describe the awful horrid and lamentable accident i have been an eye witness of is impossible yesterday morning mr downey of the company's troop left in pifinch poor mr monro son of sir hector monro and myself went on shore on sagor island to shoot deer we saw innumerable tracks of tigers and deer but still we were induced to pursue our sport and did the whole day about half past 3 we sat down on the edge of the jungle to eat some cold meat sent us from the ship and had just commenced our meal when mr pifinch had a black servant told us there was a fine deer within 6 yard of us mr downey and myself immediately jumped up to take our guns mine was the nearest and i was just i had just laid hold of it when i heard a roar like thunder and saw an immense royal tiger spring on the unfortunate munro who was sitting down in a moment his head was in the beast's mouth and he rushed into the jungle with him with as much ease as i could lift a kitten tearing him through the thickest bushes and trees everything yielding to his monstrous strength the agonies of horror regret and i must say fear for there were two tigers male and female rushed on me at once the only effort i could make was to fire at him through the poor youth was still in his mouth i relied partly on providence partly on my own aim and fired a musket i saw the tiger stagger and agitated and cried out so immediately mr downey then fired two shots and i one more we retired from the jungle and a few minutes after mr munro came up to us all over blood and fell we took him on our backs to the boat and got every medical aid assistance for him from the valentine east india man which lay at anchor near the island but in vain he lived 24 hours in extreme torture his head and skull 
were torn and broke to pieces and he was wounded by the claws all over his neck and shoulder but it was better to take him away though irrecoverable then than leave him to the to be devoured limb by limb we have just read the funeral services over his body and committed it to the deep he was an amiable and promising youth so this story was published in so many other magazines and newspapers for example the york herald of 6 july 1793 reproduced the same story that was published in times in the oracle also 4 july 1793 the whitehall evening post that replaced see how the same story is being concocted tore the unfortunate young man to pieces with tore out the heart of the unfortunate young man william blake was uh, aware of these chronicles especially the bath chronicle calcutta gazette northampton mercury and some of these went through his own printing press some because of his familiarity with these stories about the tiger and the popularity of this tiger ferocious royal bengal tiger perhaps blake selected this tiger as a subject but now the question is whether the blakian tiger is nature reinvented or rather it is an antithesis to nature a tiger that is produced by the forged by the forged iron mills or the satanic mills of england so this tiger represents the darker forces perhaps like yet a second coming darker forces produced by the changes affecting english life transitional society moving from the agrarian mode of production to a more capitalist mode of production the industrial mode of production in the other stories that source the same story from of the tiger from the east india company the universal magazine the european magazine the gentleman magazine the scots magazine the ladies magazine the wonderful magazine all these contain the same story the death of munro i must refer to the sporting mega magazine that also included a second eyewitness letter from the calcutta gazette which contributed to the authenticity of the account but added nothing of substance from such references we can conclude that at least in london news of the event had wide currency and its description was widely available we must remember that to the english children tiger is an unfamiliar asiatic animal not very popular tiger the image must have gone to england only during that time as puffed animals or as a specimen for the exhibition in the zoos even outside london the news was widely disseminated no doubt some of the interest shown in this gruesome event was due to the celebrity status of sir hector munro the victim's father the great agent of east india company and a soldier who was promoted to the rank of lieutenant general we must also remember that lord clive has returned to england and has bought five villages with the money stolen from india so this uh, man was also a soldier whose reputation had been made in india in october 1764 he had been in command of the forces which route, routed the confederated princes of hindustan at the battle of baksar in bihar and rendered the nawabs of bengal and oath powerless much of the extortion went on and the great famine of 1770 was definitely a product of this exploitation by the east india company this battle was ranked by some of as among the most decisive ever fought and brought enormous prize money to the victors in 1778 he captured pondicherry from the french he was a member of parliament and had been a general from 1782 he became a lieutenant general in 1793 blake's tiger was published in 1794 so who this tiger is is he hector whose son was mauled by the tiger and this man died in 1805 but the engravings in the sporting magazine supports the more obvious suggestions that the interest which the editors exploited so completely was not so much in munro as in the tiger itself and indeed a close examination of the article in the sporting magazine reveals that much of the interest is established in establishing the current attitudes to and knowledge about the tiger blake is consciously using this interest in the tiger a zoological animal and the interest in contemporary politics the sporting magazine article introduced the letters from the companions of munro 
by first presenting materials describing the ferocious characteristics of the tiger and supplementing this with an account of commonly held beliefs about the supposed effects of fire on the animal. The opening paragraph stressed on the tiger's ferocity. So I quote from that letter, the tiger is allowed to be the most rapacious and destructive of all the carnivores animals, fierce without provocation and cruel without necessity. His thirst for blood is insatiable. Though glutted with slaughter, he continues his carnage. He fears neither the sight nor the opposition of man, whom he frequently makes his prey. And it is generally supposed that he prefers human flesh to that of any other animal. The tiger is indeed one of the few animals whose ferocity can never be subdued. There is no acknowledgement, but this is taken, I can be sure, from the general history, a general history of quadrupeds by Thomas Bevick, published in 1790. Some of Bevick's material was consciously omitted by this reporter and was replaced by some other phrases. For example, since he stressed the animal's thirst for blood, it might have been just inappropriate and insensitive when the victim described in this article was a human being, so it was replaced. It read, the strength of animal is so great that when it was, it has killed an animal, whether it be a horse or buffalo or a deer, it carries it off with such ease that it seems no impediment to its flight. Perhaps Blake, the intelligent writer of that age, caught in this change the source of his tiger symbology and therefore his tiger is also manufactured tiger adapted to his needs in order to represent the tigers of wrath ferocious and more important to society than the horses of instruction now if we read the poem whatever i have read just now appears to be foolish inappropriate so let us read the poem it appears first reading to be a simple description of a tiger of Shundarvan. tiger tiger burning bright in the forest of the night what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry so it is also sung by blake tiger tiger burning bright the same rhythm that is used in the nursery rhyme written by jane taylor the disciple of William Blake. Second stanza, in what distance deeps of skies burn the fire of thine eyes. So distant deeps of sky refer to the shores of Bengal, the Sundarbans, distant deeps of skies burn the fires of thine eyes. On what wings dare he aspire? Referring to Icarus, Icarus with his father trapped in the tower of Critis. And Daedalus, the architect, the Grecian architect, designed the wings and Icarus put on the wings and dared to fly and he started flying up higher and higher in the sky and wanted to touch the sun. The waxen wings got melt and he got drowned by the sea. On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare sees the fire? So Prometheus brought fire. What the hand dare sees the fire. So the images, symbols appear to be more classical, Greek, loaded in Greek symbolism. The poem continues. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dear its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears, so reminiscent of the fallen angels, as described by Milton in Paradise Lost. Milton too belonged to the devil's party, according to Blake. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Dare frame thy fearful symmetry? 
the word dear perhaps is foregrounded the last key word of the poem so the first reading of the poem appears to be a poem on the tiger burning bright in the forest of ignorance or of night created by god immortal hands or eyes frame this tiger in some kind of fearful symmetry fearful symmetry is because the head of the tiger is much larger than the body and the proportion is different even the limbs of the tiger much shorter thick then we have the creation of the tiger the tiger is the product of the industrial mode of production how come a tiger a natural object become a product of the industrial mode of time of production so this industrial mechanical technico tiger disputes the logic or rational of blake's mysticism blake is more political in his commentary on the contemporary changes that are affecting because of number 1 the invention of the steam engine the industrial revolution the enclosure act the corn laws american revolution the french revolution and english radicalism and all these gradually will be shaping the rise of the rise and rise of the great empire great britain and the great multinational companies like east india company the tiger is napoleonic the tiger is like lord clive the tiger is like the radicals the tiger is like the industrial mode of production the setting meals what the tiger is at least one must be clear the tiger is not simply an image steeped in divinity and mysticism whatever divinity is there the divinity is deceptive in the tiger the tiger and the lamb often these two poems are put as a pair set in a dialectical contrast without contraries there can be no progression therefore tiger and the lamb should be put together illogical argument given by critics like mh abrams when blake wrote the lamb he did not write the tiger when he wrote the tiger he had the lamb in his mind therefore in the tiger there is the presence of the lamb the god is the creator of the tiger as well as the lamb the tiger is a short lyrical poem of 24 lines that asks without giving explicit answer how any affected god responsible for innocence and goodness can be the creator of violence and evil its questions are unanswerable for they search a realm altogether beyond human understanding divine creation occurs outside time and place through a being who is by definition incomprehensible and worthy of childlike wonder expressed by the poem speaker before the terrible beauty of a dark alien reality that william blake envisioned all reality as a duality of light and dark peace and violence good and evil innocence and experience is indicated by the full title of the volume in which the tiger appeared the songs of innocence and songs of experience showing the two contrary states of the human soul according to blake's private mythology the ideal is an is artistically and imaginatively unified humanity of cosmos harmonizing the contraries which in such poems are split into psychological realms of innocence vulnerable to victimization by a stifling adult world and of experience experiences of course about a fallen world of suffering of evil and of division so instead of an integrated primal value primal human being there is in this volume a poem of innocence and titled the lamb juxtaposed to its contrary there is another poem in the other book the songs of experience the tiger arguably the greatest and the most cryptic lyric poem of blake the poem begins with a child like speaker directly addressing a tiger and receiving no answer to repeated questions about its creation in the lamb the child is asking the same questions to the lamb here the child is asking the questions to someone else not to the tiger because tiger is removed at a distance the first three quarters describe the beast in terms of frightening beauty the tiger is a fiery luminescent intuition in the dark forest of the world of experience it is paradoxically frightening it is uh, proportion but the proportion is fearful 
asymmetrical, non-symmetrical. And the eyes burn ferociously. There is nothing symmetrical that becomes fearful in the creation of nature. The heart small smolders and pent up energy is there. And the feet, not longer feet, but thick, evoke dread. The poem asks how a being of divine might, hand and divine design, could create this terrible beauty in what primordial deep or mysterious steep can this beast be created? Did the being fashion in this, this fiery beast, where did the being get the rebellious pride of a Satan? How did this tiger become a Daedalus-like character? How did this tiger get the characteristics of Prometheus to defy the natural order of things? Where was this tiger built? Where was this tiger manufactured? How did the tiger seize the fire engendering the monstrous creature. What kind of strength is endowed in this tiger? The shoulder, the artistry of the art, the force, everything is molded, the dreadful beauty. The fourth quadrant depicts the creator as an omniscient, omnipotent blacksmith, keeping the beast under the rein and chain. As the creator fashioned its mind and yet remained supremely impervious to its terror. Blake Soho had some factories and on the river Thames they were definitely the ships built by the iron forges of England. The fifth quatrain is the most difficult to decipher and continues to stress the being's transcendent omnipotence through an obscure reference to God's victory over the rebellious angels, referring to John Milton's Paradise Lost. So with whom is the tiger fighting? The defeated rebels? Rebel angels become transmuted into stars, surrounding the spears in shower producing tears. Blake's contemporary called shooting stars angel tears and all powerful being paradoxically created and evil and destroyed it. And in the same way we are seeing that in the making of the lamb there is no ferocity involved and in the making of the tiger there is much of arrogance, anger, wrath. How can this be? The final quatrain repeats the first quatrain with haunting effect to deny readers an easy answer to the question. Yet it suggests that the creation of evil by the creator of goodness is true and beautiful, even if the divine paradox is beyond human completion. So the last quatrain uses the same concluding opening lines of the poem. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye could dare frame thy symmetry. So the word could dare frame replaces the phrase that is used in the opening stanza of the poem. And this is a remarkable change made by Blake. If the first stanza and the last stanza they are refrains, then why should William Blake change the word? There are themes, interrelated meanings of the tiger, so apparently the tiger is about divinity, about the mysterious beauty of all creation and its transcendence of the limited human perspective of good and evil that the miseries of human experience conditions one to assume. Divine creation occurs outside time and place through a being who is by definition inscrutable and worthy of the childlike wonder expressed by the poem speaker. Humans see contraries and find evil awful. The God the same God created the contraries and pronounced them both beautiful. The tiger is a Blakeian song of experience that is to be contrasted with, as I said, contrary song of innocence, the lamb. Questions also recur in the lamb, little lamb, little lamb, who made thee, does thou know who made thee. The poem, however, answers the questions in it poses with a simple, almost pat affirmation that the lamb of God and poet Christ of the realm of innocence became an innocent to make all humanity innocent in his own image and thereby make all those who are meek and mild worthy of God's blessing. So he is called by thy name. But who is telling this? He is called by thy name for he himself calls the lamb. It is a child who is telling the lamb. He is meek, he is mild, he became a little child. I a child, thou a lamb. We are called by his name. And towards the end of the poem this child becomes a preacher. 
Blake's idea of terror as represented in the tiger must be inferred on the basis of the observation that he made in his poem The Divine Image. In Divine Image he writes, cruelty as a human heart and jealousy a human face, terror the human form divine and secrecy the human dress, the human dress is a forged iron, the human form of fury forged, the human face a furnace sealed, the human heart its hungry gorge. This poem was published in 1791. So Tiger uses almost the same images and contains no explicit answers to the ultimate questions that it raises. Although some answers are implicit precisely because of the absence of answers, the questions are rhetorical in nature. The mystery of reality does not lend itself to simple pat formulations of everyday statements. If the poem The Lamb excludes all terrors and complexity from life and finds only gentleness and mindless, then the tiger rejects such simple mindedness and opposes a doubleness under a creator of mercy and aggressiveness, under a creator of peace and violence, under a creator of good and evil, and all of which are subsumed in a divine beauty beyond limited human power to grasp fully as a unity. At a time when Edmund Burke was critiquing the French Revolution for its bloody excesses and Thomas Paine was defending in his rights of man the French Revolution. There was William Blake who was producing his poem The Tiger. Is the tiger a product of that revolutionary idol or idols of the French Revolution? Is it a product of justice, equality, fraternity? Is it a product of, of the same Liberty of human beings from the shackles. Man is born free but everywhere he is in chains. The very conception of the tiger, the making of the tiger, is entailed in the forgery that is committed and in the iron mills, the satanic mills that Blake called, the tiger is created with the help of furnace and anvil. Forms and devices in the poem like songs and experience, songs of innocence and experience, the tiger is a miracle of compressed metaphor, word usage and symbols that explode into multiple suggestiveness, helping the poem attempt to perform the impossible, to apprehend the ineffable and to rest in a wonder before the inscrutable spectacle of the creator of contraries, of unity supreme over dualities and contradictions. Compressed metaphors create and equate the creator to a blacksmith in lines 13 to 16 and equate the creation of the tiger to a reckless daring of archetypal rebels such as Satan and Daedalus, even Prometheus who stormed the heavens on wings, our Prometheus who stole fire from the gods to give light and warmth to the human race. Compressed word usage generates double meaning of a creator fashioning a heart out of a twisted sinews and knotting up a heart to produce pent up energy in the tiger. Blake's deletion of words to the bare minimum needed for communication per pervades throughout the poem and pervades the description of Tiger's traits and the creator's attitudes or attributes. Compress allusions to Milton's conquered rebel angels to the Genesis account of primordial creation and to Blake's The Lamb occurring the fifth portrait to underscore the paradoxical omnipotence of the creator. At the time of French Revolution, the tiger was popularly conceived as a symbol of revolution itself. Blake welcomed the French Revolution and might have intended his tiger to be a symbol of something more than repellent evil. The tiger is although terrifying, part of God's all beautiful creation and it has an ability to comprehend everything completely. The rhythm and meter of the poem, the tiger, is meant for performance. The rhythm of Tiger resembles a famous nursery rhyme, as I told you, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, composed in 1806 by Jane Taylor. The Tiger consists of six quatrains, each of each with couplet rhymes and a rapid sing-song tetrameter of trochaics and some iambic variation. The rhyme scheme is altered in the refrain, lines 3, 4, 23, 24, with an effective foregrounding of unsymmetrical rhymes, alliteration, consonance, assonance, abound giving an incantatory effect, a mantric type of incantatory effect of a visionary nursery rhyme. The childlike speaker probing adult questions about the ultimate meaning of that remains, of what remains the mystery of reality. 
Blake is a piper poet, piping and composing poems in the pastoral mode of poetry. And in this poem, we have a communication that is done between the poet and the reader through the voice of this child narrator. Therefore, this musical cohesion of the sound that is achieved by the poem is also related to the substance, to the structure, the artifice of the poem itself. It is a carefully drawn urn or artifice that the poem is. Blake, the painter and the poet all combined together and through his illuminated print, the four-footed symmetrical stuffed toy tiger in orange and black stripes with a smile and rotund eye, almost like a tameful, peaceful cat. So this goes contrary to the image that is presented in this poem. Therefore, the visual and the verbal contradict each other. The landscape is autumnal with a large leafless tree. Few tropical stripes like bushes appear and there is a light pink sky at the background. The trunk of the tree has some images coded as one resembling a human face set parallel to second stanza. The tiger belongs to a non-European terrain and Blake must have been familiar with some reproduction of a larger painting commissioned by Maximilian I, painting by Peter Paul Rubens, tiger, titled The Tiger Hunt, set in non-European space. A reader's contemplation of the tiger symbol involved both reading and seeing it. The contradiction in the visual image and the printed orthographic image of the tiger produces a multiplicity of meaning. The tiger generates so many alternative associations with evil, wanderers, mysterious, passionate, joyous, violent, peaceful, innocent, cunning, experience, etc. So composed of the French Revolution, the tiger got associated as a symbol of revolution as Blake supported the French Revolution and Paine's Rights of Man, part one, that defended the revolution was in a sense reproduced to the tiger. The tiger is also about the divinity and mysterious beauty of all creation, but this creation is also partly man-made. Blake accepted the true God to be Jesus Christ, but also a human being. He observed that though Christ's sacrifice, through Christ's sacrifice he could throw off the apathetic religiosity into which he had been brought up. The tiger is a part of God's creation as well as a man-made artifact animated by the visual. Blake sought to use a verbal representation to depict the collapse of society, societal values at the hand of the iron forge satanic mills of England, the industrial mode of production and the capitalist mode of production. So through this discussion, we have come to this generalization and as Blake himself said that to generalize is to behave like an idiot. To generalize that this poem is multi-layered, multifaceted and multifoliated. Foliated. The creation of the tiger in the poem involves a process of regression to spiritual sterility and valorization of material production by the forces of extreme violence. Thank you.